Uh, I'm, I'm just delighted to uh, welcome you to our meeting today uh, to hear uh, Dr. Peter Angelos um, present a talk on the role of surgical ethics in the history of surgery. Um, let, let, let me say a few words about Peter. Um, uh, Peter Angelos is the Linda Kohler Anderson Professor of Surgery and Surgical Ethics, uh, the Vice Chair for Ethics and Professional Development and Wellness uh, in the Department of Surgery, the Chief of Endocrine Surgery, and the Associate Director of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, all here at the University of Chicago. Uh, a native of Plattsburgh, New York, um, where his father was a community general surgeon, Dr. Angelos completed his undergraduate degrees, medical school, and PhD in philosophy at Boston University. He then completed his residency in general surgery at Northwestern University and went on to complete fellowship in clinical medical ethics here at the university in 1991-92 and in endocrine surgery at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, Dr. Angelos, as you can imagine, is an intense and busy endocrine surgeon who's written widely on improving outcomes of thyroid and parathyroid surgery, uh, about minimally invasive endocrine surgery, uh, and, and ethical aspects in the care of surgical patients. Um, Dr. Angelos has now written more than 250 peer-reviewed publications and is authored or co-authored over 50 book chapters. Um, he edited two editions of a book called Ethical Issues in Cancer Patient Care. He's the co-editor co um, of the American College of Surgeons textbook entitled Ethical Issues in Surgical Care, and is the co-editor of a very recent um, book, uh, textbook, called Ethical Issues in Surgical Care, 750 pages long, that came out about a month or so ago. Um, it's called Difficult Decisions in Surgical Ethics. Um, uh, Dr. Angelos was also a regular contributor to the American College of Surgeons Surgery News, where he wrote a column on surgical ethics uh, from 2011 through 2019. Uh, He's the governor of the American College of Surgeons, a member of the Acad Academy of Master Surgeon Educators of the American College of Surgeons, past president of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons. And in June of 2019, uh, Dr. Angelos began a six-year term as a counselor of the American Board of Surgery. So we're very excited to hear his talk today entitled the role of surgical ethics in the history of surgery. Uh, Peter, please, it's all yours. Um, thank you, Mark, very much. Um, you, uh, you're always uh, very kind in your introductions and I, uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, so I am hoping that you are all able to see my slides okay. Um, and if that is not the case, then hopefully someone will tell me um, but, um, you know, it, it really is a pleasure for me to be part of this series. Uh, I have to say I've really enjoyed it. I think it's been one of the best series that uh, the center has had uh, in the 15 years that I've uh, been at the University of Chicago. Um, so uh, let me just see uh, if I can advance. So, um, you know, I have no financial disclosures. Um, but I do have just a few disclaimers, and and I, I want to do I, I do want to get them out of the front out out of the way in the outset. You know, I really love history, um, but I am um, I am certainly not a historian, and and I say that um, with the knowledge that there have been some absolutely fantastic uh, scholars of history who have given really erudite talks. Um, in this series. And, um, and so in that sense, I think mine is going to be a little bit different because um, this is not really a, um, you know, it's, it's not a, uh, an intensive historical study of a specific area. 
Um, but rather, I would say it's a little bit of a uh, it's a little bit of a personal journey uh, that I'll share with you, and um, I think it's related to obviously my interest in surgery and my interest in surgical ethics. Um, but also, I have to admit that I love old books, and over the years have collected a large number of antique surgical books and medical books. And so um, in an answer to the, the repeated question, why do you buy these books? I started reading them and, um, and you know, found some very interesting things. And so you know, hopefully that will be a little bit of a justification for one of my many bad habits. Um, so by way of outline, I, I will share a little bit of personal history because I think it definitely um, reflects on how I look at um, the world. Um, I'll tell you some of my initial perspective on surgical ethics, uh, a little bit about what the literature shows. And then I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about how surgical ethics and decision making in surgery has been impacted by changes in surgical care. And those are things that I think it's easy to lose track of how, um, how different things are now. Um, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about informed consent for thyroidectomy, um, because that kind of brings together surgical ethics and what I do clinically, which is endocrine surgery. Um, and then talk a little bit about the central question of surgical care. So again, I, I hope that you'll indulge me just for a couple minutes to give you a little bit of personal history. Um, uh, this uh, is a map of New York, of you know uh, the northeast of the U.S. and uh, what you see here, the red dot is Plattsburgh, New York. Um, so I have a I, I did want to put that on a map because most people don't know where Plattsburgh, New York is. Um, and Plattsburgh, New York is where I grew up. Um, and uh, that's a picture of my grandfather in front of Angelos uh, Restaurant and Bakery. So uh, my grandfather, who I was named after, Peter Angelos. Um, he actually moved from New York City to Plattsburgh because he was an illegal immigrant and figured no one would find him there. Um, and so uh, it actually worked out um, and he became a U.S. citizen. Um, uh, this is actually a uh, matchbook cover from Angelo's uh, Bakery and Restaurant that I found on eBay a couple months ago and just couldn't resist buying. It's amazing what you can find if you waste time like I do looking for antiques. Uh, so, you know, my, uh, my parents uh, were uh, Mina Angelos and S. Peter Angelos, and uh, my father grew up in Plattsburgh. Uh, my mother grew up in Montreal. Um, they got married in Montreal, and, um, and my father finished his residency, military service obligations, and returned to Plattsburgh to go into practice. Um, this is uh, what, you know, this is my parents. Uh, and the, shortly after that, they uh, moved back to Plattsburgh. And when they moved back to Plattsburgh, a small town, there were in, in fact two hospitals in this small town. There was the Champlain Valley Hospital, um, which was uh, a, a Catholic institution. And then there was the Physician's Hospital, um, which had a really beautiful lawn and ponds with swans and that sort of thing. Um, and so those were the two hospitals at which uh, my father practiced, um, community general surgeon, and uh, eventually the two hospitals merged. It became CVPH Medical Center, Champlain Valley Physicians Hospital. Um, and then now it's actually uh, been acquired by the University of Vermont. So uh, things do have a way of evolving. Um, now, my father, as I said, general surgeon, community practice, um, he grew up in Plattsburgh. He came back to Plattsburgh. He spent his entire career at Plattsburgh um, as a general surgeon. Um, and he loved being a surgeon. And um, in, uh, later in his life and earlier in my career, um, he had the chance to come to the OR and, uh, when I was operating. So it was really a lot of fun. And we shared a lot of uh, uh, discussions of cases over the years. Um, some of my personal experience, I think um, Mark was, uh, you know, mentioned that um, I did, uh, I was in medical school and then subsequently went into a PhD program and got a PhD in philosophy. 
Um, at the point when I was um, finishing um, and was applying for surgical residencies, that was uh, winter spring um, 1989. Um, you know, I, uh, I uh, found out that uh, when you write a personal statement for a surgical residency about the importance of integrating ethics into an academic surgical practice, not many people ask you questions about it. Um, and, uh, and it, you know, it was one of those things where it was almost as though I had written about something that was unrelated to surgery. Um, and there was truly an overwhelming lack of interest. I think I interviewed at about 10 uh, residencies um, and uh, nobody asked me about this interest. Nobody asked me about my PhD in philosophy, except for Dr. David Narwald who was the chair of surgery at Northwestern. And it is perhaps uh, because of his interest that I ultimately did my residency uh, at Northwestern. Um, so in the 1980s, I would say it, it seemed that very few surgeons were interested in ethics. Uh, and I can give you lots of anecdotes uh, about that, um, but you know, suffice it to say, um, there just wasn't an overwhelming uh, degree of enthusiasm. Now, in the contrary, there was a lot about medical ethics in the news. Um, and, you know, there were Time Magazine articles about it. And, um, you know, there were cover stories in Life Magazine. And, you know, there was a lot of excitement about things like the artificial heart and all kinds of new um, medical technologies and how that was impacting uh, ethics. Um, and so, you know, there was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm. Um, it, it's interesting to me, and, you know, again, I, in reflecting on uh, uh, some of the books that I've read over the years about ethics, um, I, let me just read this to you. I thought this was a very fascinating uh, suggestion um, that said, ethics is beginning to be fashionable. Almost everybody now has a notion that he knows what it means. Among American people, this is dangerous for we are very prone to get and then get over our fashionable crazes. That which yesterday everybody was talking about is tomorrow what no one ever heard of. But whether or not the word ethics becomes popular or not, I believe that any group of people who once began to look at things from an ethical point of view cannot easily break the habit and that this habit has come to stay, whether the word ever dies out or not. So I was really struck by this, that ethics is beginning to be fashionable. Um, and what was particularly interesting to me about this is that it's uh, from a book by Richard Cabot, MD, called Adventures on the Borderlands of Ethics. And what you'll note here, and those of you who aren't you know, quick in your uh, Roman numerals, this was published in 1926. So uh, I thought it was fascinating that Dr. Cabot uh, from Harvard thought that ethics was beginning to be fashionable, but he was worried that it would be a, a trend that came and went rapidly. And um, fortunately, he was not correct in that assessment. Now, there was a period of time when I thought that, you know, the way to explore um, some of the historical aspects of medical ethics and surgical ethics was to, you know, do a PubMed review. Um, and so, you know, I did that for medical ethics and I looked at medical ethics and titles and abstracts of articles. Um, and found that there, um, through 2021, there were 6,431 results. So lots of results. Um, and, uh, and in fact, you know, you'll see this is how many articles each year. So the number's going up, so that's impressive. Um, but it actually goes all the way back to 1830. That was the first mention of medical ethics in a title or abstract within PubMed. Um, and um, there are now, you know, a maximum of 432 references in a single year. That first article um, I thought was interesting. This is from uh, the Medical Surgical Review of 1830, um, and um, and I'll just read it again, because I think it's so nicely stated. Medical ethics in the modern sense, again, this is 1830, 
must be considered the most important branch of our professional studies because it involves the science of life, a knowledge of human nature, and the art of turning that knowledge to the greatest possible advantage. Now, it is very remarkable that although this notable science of life is useful art, has been cultivated with great success during the last 20 years and is now brought to the highest degree of perfection. Not a line has been written on the subject or any code of instructions put on record for the benefit of rising or falling generation. Now, you know, really uh, it's impressive how far that uh, the authors felt they had come in 1830. Um, now, I thought it was really interesting at the time when I found this article, I thought, well, gosh, you know, that's so interesting. I wonder how far back surgical ethics goes. Um, and so, so I did a similar um, review of surgical ethics and found that the first mention of surgical ethics in the literature that I could find was 1975 and that there were a total of 49 results. Um, and so really a, a much you know, shorter history, uh, much smaller number of articles, uh, maximum of eight references in a single year. Now, I have to tell you that my error in doing this review and, my, and the comparison of these areas um, is that I think I was misguided in exploring for the origins of surgical ethics by searching the literature for surgical ethics, because surgical ethics was not a term that was widely used. Um, rather, the history of surgical ethics, I think, is much better seen in the exploration of the history of surgical decision making and how that has occurred over you know, the last um, 150 plus years. Um, now, certainly the theoretical concept of surgical ethics did not exist separate from the activities of surgeons and patients. And so in that sense, I think that any, any attempt to find, uh, to find some discussion of surgical ethics is going to be missed if you do what I did, which was look for surgical ethics in the literature, because that's not the way it was discussed. So, so I do think that in this context, it's really important to um, correctly place surgical ethics within the realm of clinical practice and clinical medical ethics. So clinical medical ethics, um, as you know, many of you who, were, who heard Dr. Siegler's talk a few weeks ago, um, clinical medical ethics as established and cultivated by Mark is a practical endeavor between patients and physicians focused on benefiting the patient. So it derives from this clinical encounter. And I would say that clinical medical ethics is thus very clearly to be distinguished from theoretical bioethics. It is not a theoretical activity. Um, certainly one can have hypothetical discussions, but clinical medical ethics at is its essence, I think is very much related to that clinical encounter. Now, surgical ethics, by definition, I would argue, is clinical surgical ethics because one cannot, in fact, have theoretical surgical ethics because, again, surgical ethics is very much embedded in the activities of surgeons and patients and their interactions. And so I would argue that just as operating is essential to the practice of surgery, surgical ethics cannot be separated from surgical practice. And for that reason, I think it's valuable to think a little bit more about surgical practice and how decisions were made in surgical practice in order to better understand some things about surgical ethics. So, um, for that reason, I think, you know, it's essential to, to look back at some history and, you know, we won't go back too far. Um, but again, some of the issues that I think are relevant when it comes to surgical ethics and surgical decision making, I think it's impossible to think about the history of surgical ethics without understanding the challenges of surgery prior to anesthesia and antisepsis. So, 
Um, you know, this is a, you know, it's a somewhat cartoon view of an amputation. This is um, from uh, Rawlinson, the amputation um, around 1800. And now what's impressive is, of course, that the patient is awake. Now, for surgeons, you know that you can't actually amputate a leg with a saw like that because the saw works on the bone, but not so good on the soft tissue. So you've got to get to the bone before you use the soft tissue. But think about it. This is all done with an awake patient. Um, now, surgery prior to anesthesia was an absolutely harrowing experience for the patient. I would argue also for the surgeon and often for the medical students who paid to be in the galleries. And so, you know, operations were, um, they weren't public spectacles, but they were very much viewed by, um, by students who paid tickets to actually be admitted into the gallery to observe. Um, now, it is also true that surgeons often downplayed the horrors of the operation to protect the patient from worry. Now, you know, with this in mind, I, I think it's valuable to think about how our current concepts of informed consent um, could actually be manifested when the patient's gonna go through such an absolutely horrific experience. Um, and so, you know, most surgeons uh, by report really downplayed the, the, the sheer pain associated with operations. Um, there is a story of a 12 year old boy who recalled asking his surgeon if his upcoming leg amputation for tubercular swelling of the knee would hurt. And the surgeon's response was no more than having a tooth out. Um, and the boy was brought to the operating theater blindfolded, pinned down by the surgeon's assistants. And then by the patient's own account, 60 years later, when he re relayed this to medical students, the boy counted six strokes of the saw before his leg dropped off. So, you know, think about that experience and what that must have done, not only to the patient, but also, you know, everyone who witnessed it, including the surgeon. Now, um, some of you know about the history of Mr. Robert Liston. Um, because he was in London, uh, surgeons were not doctors. This is Mr. Robert Liston. Uh, and he was London's most renowned surgeon in 1846. Um, he operated at University College Hospital. Um, he had a very successful practice. And in addition, um, he was able to, you know, since he did a lot of surgery and medical students needed to see operations, he was very popular uh, professor. Now, he was reportedly eight inches taller than the average London man in the 1800s, and he used that height um, and reportedly uh, tremendous strength to his advantage. Um, and he was known uh, as the fastest knife in the West End. Uh, because of the speed with which he was able to operate. And many of the operations in those days were in fact amputations. Um, so Liston built his reputation on brute force and speed. Um, and you know, speed was essential to patient survival because you know, he described taking off a leg, doing a leg amputation. And he talked about how one had to grip the leg tightly and then sort of clamp down on the vessels as rapidly as possible to prevent exsanguination. So you had to get the leg off so you could clamp those vessels and tie them. Um, and uh, it, reportedly the gleam of his knife was followed so instantaneously by the sound of sawing as to make the two actions appear to be almost simultaneous. Um, and so again, he would rapidly cut through the soft tissue to get to the bone and cut through the bone very quickly. Um, and you'll see a couple references to this book, The Butchering Art by Lindsay Fitzharris. I think it's an excellent book. I totally enjoyed it um, and I would recommend it to you. Um, this is you know, a portrait of Liston. 
um, about to do an amputation. Um, his reportedly most famous case was a leg amputation in 2.5 minutes, um, which you know anyone who's been in the OR today, that's very impressive because we have to wait three minutes just for our prep solution to dry and we time it on the clock. So the amount of time we're waiting for the prep to dry, he was done with his operation. Unfortunately, the assistant who was holding the patient's leg lost three fingers um, while switching blades uh, a spectator who was a little too close, his coat was slashed. Um, the patient subsequently died of gangrene. The assistant, unfortunately, also died of gangrene. And the spectator was so shocked by the ordeal that he reportedly expired on the spot. So one operation in 300% mortality. Now, clearly that would not go over well today. Um, but I think, you know, maybe this is a true story, maybe it's not, but it was, you know, indicative of the speed and the danger associated with the operation. So in the 1840s, surgery was by no means for the faint of heart. Um, patients were at risk of severe pain. And even if they survived that surgical ordeal, the pain of the operation, they were at risk of dying of infection. Now, in addition, surgeons were also at risk of dying of infection. So, you know, when before we had the germ theory, nobody wore gloves. Why would you wear gloves? Gloves are a recent invention by Halstead, who wanted to keep his scrub nurse's hands from being irritated by the antiseptic solution. Um, due to the risks, many surgeons completely refused to operate on patients and focus their practice on the treatment of external ailments like skin conditions and superficial wounds, rather than taking on things like removing tumors or doing amputations. In fact, operations were relatively uncommon events due to the risks that the surgeon and the patient both had to assume. Um, and in fact, records say that in 1840, there were only 120 operations performed at Glasgow's Royal Infirmary, you know, one of the largest hospitals in the city. Um, so it was a very unusual thing. And it is partly because it was so unusual that students flocked to surgical operations to, to you know, gain that education because it just didn't happen that often. And surgery was always thought of as a last resort. And I actually think that this concept of surgery as a last resort has had some reverberations throughout history. And so even today, when it's obviously much safer, um, frequently in the mind of surgeon, uh, in the mind of patients at least, surgery is a last resort. Now, without question, uh, anesthesia created a revolution in surgical care. Um, and as many of you know, the first public demonstration of uh, medical ether uh, was in uh, 1846 uh, by Dr. William Morton. Um, the patient, Edward Gilbert Abbott, uh, had a neck tumor reportedly uh, um, and had surgery at the amphitheater at Massachusetts General Hospital, um, now still preserved as the ether dome. Um, this is the, the representation of that event, um, the first uh, operation under general anesthesia um, in, uh, that was reported in the U.S. Now, there's some controversy. There are other people who did it before uh, Morton, um, but they, they didn't publish about it until after the fact, so it's controversial. But certainly, this created a, uh, a revolution. And ether as a general anesthetic was widely accepted pretty rapidly. Um, Liston, in fact, performed the first leg amputation under general anesthesia in December of 1846 in London. So the same year that Morton performed surgery that fall, you know, Liston did an amputation in London the same year. Um, and so certainly a major change in surgical care resulted. And you know, this is indicative of that change. So now this is the Agnew Clinic by Eakins, uh, 1889 um, uh, oil painting. And so um, uh, Agnew is here 
you know, able to not rush through an operation, but in fact, spend time, lecture to the gathered students that are in the gallery. The patient is presumably getting drop ether anesthetic. Um, and so, you know, the, the operation can take as long as necessary. And I mean, if you're an anesthesiologist, then longer than necessary. Um, so certainly there were big changes. Um, but unfortunately, anesthesia did not solve all the problems because again, without antisepsis and a germ theory of infection, surgical patients and surgeons themselves were still at significant risk of infection. Um, and so at that time, surgeons believed that pus was a natural part of the healing process. And most deaths, post-operative deaths, were due to post-operative infections. Um, now, as I mentioned, not only did many patients die of infection, but surgeons as well died. And operative surgery was really a very, very filthy business. Um, Thomas Percival, who in ethics people you know, look to as an important historical figure, Percival advised surgeons to change their aprons and clean the table between procedures to avoid everything that might incite terror. But few surgeons actually heeded this advice. It was almost like, you know, um, it was a, a point of pride that one had, you know, a, a bloody apron and, and bloody uh, instruments. Now, Joseph Lister, um, who's pictured here, a very austere gentleman, um, he was a British surgeon um, uh, who was known as the father of modern surgery. Uh, and through a really incredible series of experiments and collaboration with uh, Pasteur, Lister developed a method of cleaning surgical instruments and dressing wounds with carbolic acid that really dramatically reduced the risks of infection. And so this is a, a, an illustration. Um, so again, it's a, it's a totally uh, clean environment, you know, with the white, you know, white uh, cloths and this carbolic acid that was um, sprayed in the air, even to kill airborne uh, pathogens. So by the late 1800s, um, general anesthesia was widely adopted, antisepsis and this, what was known as the Listerian approach to operating room cleanliness was gaining acceptance. Um, however, challenges did remain that continued to make surgery the last resort for many patients. Um, and you know, just to, just to um, share a few words about something again, that clinically um, I deal with all the time, and that is, um, let me just share with you some of the historical issues with thyroidectomy, um, because I think it's, um, it, it's sort of illustrative. Um, Samuel Gross was a very uh, influential surgeon in uh, the mid 1800s in the US. Um, and so this is Gross, um, uh, this is also a portrait by Eakins. Um, this is an earlier portrait, um, but, uh, and so, you know, this is before there was uh, uh, all of the antisepsis, um, but there was general anesthesia, so the patient's actually asleep. Um, but uh, uh, Gross, you know, wrote a textbook of surgery um, that was very influential in the 1860s in the U.S., um, and this is what he said about thyroid surgery. Thus, whether we view the operation in relation to the difficulties which must necessarily attend its execution or with reference to the severity of the subsequent inflammation, it is equally deserving of rebuke and condemnation. No honest and sensible surgeon, it seems to me, would ever engage in it. You know, he goes on to say a couple of paragraphs later that, you know, uh, that anyone who tries to do this is going to be faced with torrents of blood and lucky will it be for him if his victims survive his, this horrid butchery. So that was his view of thyroid surgery, which, you know, it's a fairly strong view. Um, and obviously things changed over time. Now, um, Theodore Coker, who's uh, pictured here, was a major um, force in the history of thyroid surgery. 
Um, he was born in Bern, Switzerland, supposed to spend most of his career there um, and uh, was the professor of surgery and director of the, the, the um, university clinic. Um, early in his experience, the mortality risk, so the risk of dying of a thyroidectomy was approximately 12%. Um, and later, later series, that mortality risk had declined to 1%. And Coker was such a meticulous surgeon that he was known to actually preserve the parathyroid glands even before the parathyroid glands had been described as a separate organ. Um, and so it's fascinating. There were sort of two schools of, of surgical approach. Coker was the very meticulous operation where he tried to remove the whole thyroid and leave the parathyroids. And his patients died of myxedema coma when he took out most of the thyroid because they had so little thyroid. Now, Bill Roth was another famous surgeon in Europe. Bill Roth was known as being a very fast surgeon who operated extremely fast, sort of more along the Liston approach, uh, but he did lots of thyroid operations. And so his patients, he left enough thyroid tissue that most of them didn't have problems with hypothyroidism, but they did have problems with tetany because the parathyroids were removed. Uh, so you had to sort of pick which way you wanted to go. Um, Coker uh, was the one who was ultimately more successful in that um, uh, his approach was widely uh, emulated and he won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1909. Now, surgery for Graves' disease even beyond um, Coker's um, Nobel Prize remain challenging. Um, and, and I would say it's, um, it was particularly challenging um, prior to safe antithyroid drugs. So Graves' disease, which was also known as exophthalmic goiter, um, is, you know, it's especially before antithyroid drugs, it was challenging. Um, there were certainly challenges in preoperative management because if one did not have a good way of making a patient euthyroid, getting their thyroid hormone level down to normal, um, it was challenging. Um, the thyroid gland is very vascular. Um, and I would say even today, removal of a large Graves thyroid gland continues to be challenging. Um, but thyroid storm is a particular risk. So if a patient is hyperthyroid and we take them to the operating room, even today, we're at risk of them having a huge release of thyroid hormone and going into thyroid storm. And that's a, a you know, real medical issue. So George Kreil um, was a surgeon who came up with an innovative approach to solve what he thought was the problem of operating on patients with Graves' disease. Um, Kreil was, interestingly enough, the founder of the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and so if you look at the history of surgical clinics, the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic that Kreil started, the Leahy Clinic that was founded by Dr. Leahy in Boston, um, all of these, um, much of their early volume was taken up by doing thyroid surgery. Um, well, Kreil was very influential and he described a new approach to the challenge of operating on Graves' disease patients. So this is his um, article from uh, JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association in uh, 1911. Um, so it was a new principle of operating based on a study of 352 operations. So Kreil wrote, in several desperate cases, in which the margin of uh, safety of patients is, was tested by anesthetizing without the patient's knowledge with ether or with nitrous oxide, there was a moderate though short exacerbation of Graves' symptoms. And so daily inhalations, which are presumably for some medicinal purpose. So essentially you bring a patient to the hospital, you tell them, we're gonna have you inhale this every day. Um, but those, that's actually a practice rehearsal for your ether anesthesia. And so, so the idea was to sneak up on the patient and do their operation without them knowing that it was coming. Um, and so really interesting that was referred to, an, an approach that was referred to as stealing the thyroid. Patients knew that they were to have surgery at some point, but they were misled about when it would occur. 
Um, now, just to reflect on, you know, was this something that was, um, you know, was this problematic? What was the view of informed consent at that time? So this is um, from a um, textbook called uh, American Practice of Surgery by Bryant and Buck um, in 1911. Um, they wrote, the fact that the surgeon can never foretell the complications which may arise in the progress of an operation nor the limitations of the disease renders it imperative for his own protection from censure that he should obtain the full and specific consent of the patient or other person who may be responsible for his care before undertaking the operation. So certainly the concept of telling a patient about an operation, obtaining informed consent um, was you know, widely accepted within surgical practice at the time. But there was an ambivalence toward the informed consent for uh, operating on Graves patients. Um, so this is uh, from a uh, interesting book called Surgical Errors and Safeguards by uh, Max Thorak. Um, some of you are familiar with Thorak Hospital, which still exists in Chicago, started by Dr. Thorak. Um, so he wrote this book in 1936. Um, and he wrote, in patients with exophthalmic goiter, morphine should be administered to the patient in bed before he's taken to the operating room and nothing should suggest to him any reason for fear or anxiety. I usually withhold from the patient the date of the approaching ordeal. So I thought that was really fascinating. So here he's, you know, he's write, written a book about errors and safeguards and he's saying, you know, maybe don't really tell your patient about this. Um, and in fact, as late as 1962, the description of the thyroid steel for Graves' disease was noted. So this is from an article of 2016, but one of the authors reported on his experience as an anesthesiologist. He said the patient was unable to take antithyroid medication. Beta blockers were not available at that time and radioiodine was not deemed appropriate. The patient was told that the treatment with thyroid calming medicine given rectally was needed during four days prior to the thyroidectomy. But on the third day, the patient was given a barbiturate enema and was then taken to the operating theater and a successful thyroidectomy was undertaken. So it's fascinating to me. So 1962, I mean, that's not that long ago, but still this is a situation in which the details of when the operation was gonna happen were certainly not shared with the patient. And the patient was in fact deliberately misled about why the doctors were doing what they were doing. Now, obviously that's, uh, uh, I've been focusing on, you know, one particular surgical um, operation, um, but I do think that it's interesting to turn from informed consent for that one operation um, to what I think is uh, uh, the greater central question of surgical care. Um, and I do think that much of the history of surgery has been focused on the question, what can be done for this patient? Um, so, so early on when there wasn't a lot of options, um, you know, that was what surgeons, everyone, all physicians asked, what can we do? What can be done for this patient? Um, I do think that um, increasingly this is an inadequate question. Um, and the more important question is what should be done for this patient. Now, I had for a long time thought that this question was a relatively contemporary question. Um, and I thought, in fact, that this is a new question for surgery that, you know, 100 years ago, people were not asking this question. They were back to the basic, what can we do? Um, but in fact, I think I may uh, be wrong about my assessment. So Sir William Stokes, um, this is a picture of uh, Mr. Stokes. Um, he was a prominent surgeon. He was described as the surgeon in ordinary to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Now, I don't know what that means, but that was his title. Um, and he was past president of the Royal College of Surgeons and of the Pathological Society of Ireland. So again, very prominent guy. And he actually 
uh, wrote a monograph entitled The Ethics of Operative Surgery that was published in 1894. Um, so this is from the Dublin Journal of Medical Sciences, November 1894. Um, and it was a dr an address uh, by um, Sir William Stokes to the medical students of the Meath Hospital and County Dublin Infirmary. Um, and I just, you know, I, I, when I found this, I had to buy it. Uh, of course, you know, I have a, a weakness for buying these antique uh, books. Um, and I think this may be the first use of surgical ethics in the literature, even though I could never find it in a PubMed. Um, Stokes actually stated, a consideration of medical ethics that frequently exercises the mind of the operating surgeon is the question of the principles that should guide him in dealing with cancerous growths. The question as to what constitutes justification in dealing with them in an operative way is ever present and surrounded with difficulty as the result of such interference must end in weal or woe, satisfaction or regret to the patient as to the operator. Now, um, the, the same central question that Stokes referred to in this monograph, I think remains in the care of every patient with cancer or any other surgical problems even today. And that is, do the risks of the operation outweigh the potential benefits for the patient? And again, one cannot answer this in a general fashion, but only with a better understanding of what are in fact the patient's goals and what are the potential benefits for the patient. Now, um, I think that uh, there have been, um, you know, certainly uh, emphasis on practical ethical guidelines that I've found in some of the earlier surgical texts. And I'll just share a couple of these with you. Again, this is from Max Thorek's book. Um, he wrote, how can it be possible that a surgeon would do an unnecessary operation or attempt to do an operation which he was not competent to perform? Such infractions result from three causes, ignorance, dishonesty, and bad judgment. Uh, so so I, I was thinking about this this morning at our m, &M conference, um, but I don't think that there was ignorance or, or dishonesty um, or even bad judgment there. But this is something that, again, it's sort of, uh, a, a refrain in the, in the text. Um, Thorax said he should never do an operation on a patient which he would not want to have done in himself under the same circumstances. Now, to me, this is a central ethical tenant. So this is a central uh, foundation of surgical ethics, um, but you're not going to find this as a, this is part of surgical care. And so in essence, I do think that my early uh, search for, you know, where's the surgical ethics and surgical care? Well, it's part of surgical practice. And so it's not something that could be separated out from surgical practice. And in fact, it was identified um, by these authors and others. Um, I would say that I am very optimistic after having looked back at some of the history of surgical ethics, I'm optimistic for the future. I think that we're seeing more than a realization of the importance of, of surgical ethics and surgical patient care, but more of a reawakening of this importance. Um, I do think that there, there may have been times when surgeons have perhaps focused too much on the technology and not enough on the patient. Um, and I think we're always at risk of that. We need to be sure that we don't let that happen. I think that as our possible interventions have increased, the question of what is best for each individual patient remains central to surgical decision-making. Um, and I think that we cannot ever hope to answer the question, what is best for my patient without attending to the ethical dimensions of surgical care. And that means communicating with patients and understanding their values with respect to our possible interventions. Um, so I do want to leave you with a few conclusions. I think surgical ethics is not a new idea, um, but I think it's a rediscovery of a fundamental um, aspect of surgical practice. I think that surgeons cannot ignore the ethical dimension of our surgical practice and surgical patient care. I think that surgical ethics expertise 
is actually critical to the contemporary education of surgeons. Uh, and I do think that the discipline of surgical ethics owes a, a debt of gratitude to Dr. Mark Siegler for supporting surgeons and surgical scholarship in ethics um, over many years. Um, and, you know, Dr. Siegel was very nice to mention this book that recently came out with my co-authors, um, Basile and Peggy. Um, it was really, you know, a, a tremendous um, experience for me to get to work with them. Uh, I do want to just share uh, with all of you that um, this book was dedicated to Mark and Anna Siegler and what we wrote, which we three editors felt very strongly, your guidance of hundreds of clinical ethics fellows through their time at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and your collective enthusiasm, warmth, and dedication to the study of clinical medical ethics have inspired this book. Um, so with that, I do wanna thank you all very much uh, for your attention. Uh, thank you for the honor of, you know, giving a talk in this series and um, I'm happy to answer questions. Well, that was absolutely uh, terrific, Peter. And um, just as a person, as a surgeon, as a colleague, you are extraordinary and that was incredible. And I do want to uh, mention that that book you mentioned, The Butchering Art, is really uh, well written and it brings kind of Lister's journey of improved surgical care and um, decreasing surgical mortality really uh, to light because the author is just excellent. Um, so I'm Absolutely. Gonna, it's yeah. just, yes. And the other thing, just on a practical level, I just want to say one thing before we get to Peggy. I think one of the things that's really important is that for clinicians and clinical medicine, sometimes history can become more relevant to us when it has kind of an emotional valence, when either it happens to us personally, professionally, the lived experience makes it more real and interesting and compelling in a way that I think our historian colleagues don't necessarily get the same impact. And I think it what makes clinicians more passionate once they get exposed to that. But I, I uh, want to just um, let Peggy Mason take the floor away. Thanks, Peter. That was a great talk. I, I loved it. I, I, thanks for telling us about your family background in Plattsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for indulging me. <laughs> that was great. Um, I, I'm just struck by one of your final points, which is that uh, the surgeon should never do an operation on a patient which he would not want done on himself. And, you know, I, I just completely 100% do not resonate with that. So I'm, I'm really curious how you, you get to that. Um, I, I just, uh, there are not always mirrors for each one of us. And certainly the surgeon is not a mirror for every one of us. So w why would we why would we need to align the surgeon's values with the patient's values? Yeah, so that's, um, you know, as always, Peggy, it's a great question and it's a very thoughtful one. And, and I guess I would say that um, the way I look at it is not that, not that I would want to have the operation done on myself or that I would, or that I would necessarily make the same decision to have that operation, but rather that if it's, if it's something that I don't think, um, let me give you an example. I, it, it's a little bit, it's hard for me to define, um, but you know, years ago, um, not that many years ago, but a number of years ago, there was uh, a lot of enthusiasm about an operation called a, uh, robotic assisted trans axillary thyroidectomy, right? So instead of making an incision in the neck, we made incisions in the axilla and, you know, made sort of essentially made a tunnel from here to here, use a robot to get the thyroid, no visible scar in the neck. So I thought, well, that sounds like a crazy operation. I'm not really interested in it, but I also thought I shouldn't be overly critical without learning how to do it. So I learned how to do robotic surgery. I did all my training and all that stuff. And so then, and I did one and, and I did it and you know, I had told the patient, you're going to be my first patient, et cetera. 
Um, and you know, she was very enthusiastic. I was enthusiastic. I did the case. It went fine. It took four and a half hours. So like four times as long as it should have taken if I had just done an open operation. And at the end of that operation, I felt like, you know, not only would I not choose to have this operation on me, I wouldn't let anyone in my family have the operation because the risks of avoiding a visible scar were so high that in my opinion, I shouldn't even offer it. Now, it is true that I am to some extent by not offering that operation by, so I don't do that operation anymore. I said, you know, one and done, I, I've decided I'm not gonna offer it. If someone wants it, I'll refer them to other people who believe in it, who do it. Um, and, you know, that's okay. Um, but, but I guess that's sort of how I look at it is it's sort of like a, a, it's a threshold where it's not necessarily that our values have to align but I at least have to believe enough in an operation to feel like I can do it safely and that, um, that, it's, that, that there's some threshold of benefit. Now, this is problematic because I am to some extent imposing some ethical judgment, much like we do when we talked a few weeks ago about saying to a patient, I'm not offering surgery the risks are too high, right? I sometimes make that decision on behalf of my patients. Um, and that is to some extent a paternalistic approach. Um, but that's the aspect in which I think there has to be this sort of threshold that I'd be willing to have it done on me. Well, I, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting answer because you basically are saying that you're evaluating the surgery. You're not evaluating the surgery for the patient, which is not, so you're saying, I'm going to offer this patient, patient unknown. Or I am either going to do this or I'm not going to do this. It has nothing to do with that person's values. Yeah. In so the, that, in that, that makes case, a lot absolutely. of sense. Yes. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Modi, you're up. Thanks. Great talk, uh, Peter, as always. Um, so your exploration of history a little bit sort of, you know, it all naturally draws into comparison to some of the things that have changed over the years. And one thing that strikes me is, as being somewhat unique for surgeons at this time in history is that probably for the first time ever, majority of surgeons will be employed uh, rather than independent physicians. And, and I wonder what, you know, if you think that has any impact on some of these uh, domains of professionalism and surgical ethics that, that we think about, or you know, just in broad strokes, what you think the effects of that may be or what we should look at or, or be concerned about going forward? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question, Parth. Um, I, I do think that it has the potential to have an impact um, that um, is worrisome to me. Um, and so, you know, I, I see it more along the lines of, um, uh, um, sort of uh, practice arrangements that um, reward physicians for keeping the business within the practice. And so, so you know, um, so, so for example, there are, you know, there are systems in which um, if you refer too many patients outside of the practice, you get penalized or um, you know, financially penalized, or if you, you know, if the significant percentage of your referrals are within your network, you know, within your particular practice, maybe you get a bonus. Um, and so, so in, in some ways, I actually think that this is potentially problematic because um, there's, a, there's an inherent then conflict of interest for a providing physician. Um, and, and similarly, I think you know, surgeons are, are as guilty of that as others, that, you know, if we don't, you know, if a patient says, who should I go to? And we say, well, you know, you should obviously go to someone in my group because then I reap the financial benefits as opposed to sort of going outside of my group and, you know, getting perhaps, uh, you know, a different approach. So, so I think that that's a real risk. What's striking to me, and I, and I actually think you know, somebody should, somebody should look at this. I, I, I you know, I, I at one time um, thought it would be valuable to explore, but, you know, years ago, 
um, there's a tremendous amount of emphasis on uh, the unethical practice of fee splitting. So fee splitting, for those of you who aren't so familiar with it, fee splitting was essentially, and, and I may be, you know, it, it, it may not always be in this fashion, but if a general practitioner, for example, referred to a surgeon, and then the surgeon said to the general practitioner, now you be my surgical assistant. So, so essentially, the surgeon's fees would then, some portion of that would go to the assistant. And that was almost like a kickback to getting that patient referred. Um, and so that was considered absolutely unethical. And the American College of Surgeons was widely against, and there was all kinds of you know, stuff about how fee splitting was horrible and unethical. Um, and it does strike me that a modern version of fee splitting is keeping things within our network and you know, not necessarily referring to the person who perhaps has the greatest amount of experience. But um, you know, so I, so I think it's a potential risk. You know, it's fascinating to me, the evolution of surgery, because as uh, two things, from an internal medicine point of view, the rise of, you know, the, sur the rise of surgery in the 20th century is the rise of hospitals, the rise of, you know, um, the American Hospital Association, the professionalism of nursing. It's all amazing, you know, um, the role of surgery. I think the most fascinating thing you raised, and I think this is the really interesting thing, is how do you make advances in surgery knowing that there are procedures that you're going to do on patients which may not benefit them or harm them in the process? I mean, I think we do that less than we used to do, but certainly, you know, in the evolution of looking for newer, better techniques. And, you know, Shelley McKellar talked a little bit about that, about what's the last resort. And just, you know, on, a, on the flip side is think about the fact that we now go to so many surgical procedures as a first line therapy, you know, or that's changing, you know, orthopedic surgery. I mean, just as I was listening to Dr. Modi, you know, the Hippocratic Oath is against cutting for stone. God knows that urology is now not only part of the traditional medical professionalism, but it's a highly respected and valued you know, colleague in a way that, you know, you can see the changes over time. So I just think it'd be also interesting from your perspective, the evolution of, you know, on a personal level, the evolution of surgery in your personal and professional life. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, um, uh, thanks, Mindy, for asking. It, it is, I do think it's a real challenge. Um, and, and, you know, the, <laughs> The, the, the difficulty is that, you know, medical school is, you know, four years and then, uh, you know, surgical residency is five to seven. And if you do a fellowship, it's maybe another year or two. Um, so, you know, it seems like a really long time, but then you're in practice for a very long time. Uh, and so, so there are things that, you know, come up and change and, you know, we, we, we start doing things on people and, you know, sometimes we're sometimes the challenge is that there are others with more experience than we have, but we're still offering it to people. And then sometimes it's that we just don't really know if it's a good idea or not. But you know, we think it's a good idea, and so we tell patients about it. And you know, I, I had a, a an attending surgeon when I was a resident once who said that. Um, patients will always do what he recommends. And I said, well, you know, why is that? And he said, well, because I'm going to always convince them that I'm giving them the best recommendation. And I do think that, that, that the um, surgeon is in a tremendous, there's a tremendous power differential in knowledge and expertise and whatnot. And if a surgeon says, well, I got this great operation, it's brand new, and I think it's going to be perfect for you, very few patients are going to be skeptical of that. Most patients are going to say, great, sign me up. Um, and so I do think that it creates a tremendous, it's a risk, but it also creates this um, uh, burden uh, to be certain that we're not offering things that just are good for us, but are also good for our patients. And I want to just um, follow up on the chat. There was a really good question from um, September Williams, who said, um, where do you stand on the removal of you know, the artifices or the art of history 
where um, you have people like J. Marion Sims, where there were standard procedures done 100 years ago that are now either the way they were done, the procedures themselves, who they were done on, is really, you know, has gone full circle. And now we look at them with, um, don't believe that they are the standard of practice and believe that we were not acting in patients' best interests. What do you think about that? Yeah, so uh, thanks, September. <laughs> it's good to see you. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that that is a, um, it's a very challenging question, how to, how to look back at, you know, these supposed giants and say, you know, that wasn't, you know, not only was it a bad idea and a bad operation, but that it was, you know, the way you studied it, the way you came to about to do what you are doing and thought was a good idea was also unethical. Um, and so, so, you know, I, I think that it is, uh, it's imperative that we um, not have a narrow view of, you know, sort of what's good and bad. I think that so many uh, historical figures in surgery and throughout life have both positive and negative aspects of their, their, you know, their lives, their careers and whatnot. And I think that we ought not put people on this high pedestal as though they were, you know, they were the epitome of everything great. Um, I think that there's a, that it is a, it's a troubled and nuanced history. And I think that we do need to acknowledge that. And I think that that's um, that if we don't do that, then I think we, in essence, we cheapen all of the things that we say we value now about informed consent and about you know the ability for pa for patients to participate in decisions, et cetera. Dr. Heckmott, did you want to say something? Unmute yourself, my friend. Uh, about what <clears throat> Peggy said, uh, want to follow that. Uh, some years ago, when I was younger, I had a patient who had uh, paraplegia and in a machine and couldn't talk, and it was it was so frightening to me. What would happen if I would have been in his place? And you have seen paraplegic patient, so. <clears throat> The family asked me, what would you do, doctor? And I said, well, I would prefer to die. And then about a few years later, the patient was rehabilitated. Family came to me and criticized me that you said uh, you wanted to die and he is doing very well. Now, then I told the truth to the patient. I really want it. But if today you were asking me that question, I would have liked to have the, all the treatment. So the question is, we really need to know the patient far more than what the patient is before we say, what would we do on us or our own family, the situation. We need to know. So some, about a year ago, I were to have an operation. I know that there is always a risk when we choose a doctor or we choose a lawyer. So I told my doctor, I will never criticize you. I will promise never sue you. But just tell me what the effect of this operation is as a whole and let me choose it. I am interested in ethical issue, but don't think of any other situation if this happened. You don't tell me what would you do on you. Just tell me what was the effect. Would that be a better answer to tell the person that these are the issues and not just in one word or two words, perhaps requires a day or two, and then tell, you tell me what to do. And if I find that what the patient was bizarre selection, then I withdraw, I say, I would not do it. But if I see it's reasonable, despite the fact that I wouldn't want it on myself, do it on the patient. Yeah. Um, 
Thanks, Javad. That's, you know, I think it's a good question. Um, I do, I think that this, this issue, what would you do if you were me? Or what would you do if, you know, you were my, you know, insert, you know, whatever the relationship, mother, father, sister, brother, um, increasingly it's, you know, what would you do if I were your, your child, you know, as I'm getting older, that's what I keep getting asked. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, I, I think that what's hard about that, and, and I, I'm, I'm very sensitive to the fact that patients, I think appropriately are seeking advice. And I think that um, it's a, a bit of a pet peeve of mine that we so frequently talk about what we offer to patients. So I'll hear, you know, surgeons say, well, I offered them this operation. Um, and, and it seems to me that there are situations in which there are, you know, legitimately multiple choices that are both, that are all medically appropriate. Um, and in those circumstances, I think that in order to answer the question, what would you do if you were me or, you know, my relative, um, I do think that we've got to pause and explore a little bit more, as you said. Um, and I also think that um, I actually think we have a responsibility to give a patient a recommendation when they ask for it. I think that that's something that we should do. I think we should be, you know, if you go to an expensive restaurant, um, you get a recommendation from the waiter. If you go to you know, an inexpensive restaurant, they just give you the menu and you got to pick yourself. So I think we at least ought to be as good as you know, the expensive restaurant and make a recommendation. Um, but that being said, I think that it is, it's not enough to just say, well, I would do X. I think that we ought to say, well, because I value these things, I would choose this. But if I valued some other things more, I might choose something different. And so, so I do think that putting our recommendation in the context of you know, why we're making that recommendation, I think is also part of our responsibility. And I don't think that we do that as much as we should. Excellent. I was gonna let Ed Kaplan, who's on the line here, um, speak. Peter, that was a wonderful talk. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks, Ed. It was wonderful. I, I finished my residency in 1967 at the University of Pennsylvania. I saw Dr. Rabden do a thyroid steal on one occasion where he injected, I don't remember if it was barbiturates or what, we would go in and inject something in the patient's arm every, every day. And uh, then finally, without telling him, we went to the operating room and, and treated his uh, Graves' disease. Uh, things have changed. When I started my internship, there were no oral diuretics, for example, for heart failure. And uh, people gave uh, mercurial diuretics at that time, just as one example. And, and uh, I just, one other thing that is profoundly different, that in the city of Philadelphia, not one surgeon or internist would tell anyone that they had cancer. There was one surgeon at Graduate Hospital, which is one of the hospitals in Philadelphia, uh, name, his name was Ferguson, and he was the only s s doctor in, every, in Philadelphia that would tell the patient that they had cancer. Everybody would tell the family, but no one would tell the, uh, the patient. The professor of medicine, Francis Wood, when I was a medical student, gave us a talk about how his grandmother had a mass in her lung that they saw on, on chest x-ray. And to the day that she died, he told her that it was tuberculosis and wouldn't tell her that it was a cancer. So things have really changed. And uh, there are many, I mean, that's just a few examples of uh, profound changes 
that have occurred. I enjoyed your talk immensely. It was wonderful, Peter. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ed. I, I appreciate it. I, it's amazing that you actually uh, saw a patient have the stealing the thyroid procedure. I'm very impressed. <laughs> Well, anyway, so there was a lot of interesting comments in the chat, but I think, Peter, you deserve at least 15 minutes before we do the afternoon session. That's our new thing is we've got to give our um, our speakers a little break to get up and stretch their legs. And just on behalf of the McLean Center, it's always a pleasure to welcome one of our colleagues and our friends to give us a talk. And the personal stuff is really huge because um, you know where you come it's it's like that show um finding our roots i love that thing is because history really can be very personal you know if you find that your grandfather was like a slave owner or that some of your relatives did something either heroic or terrible it affects you personally eons down the line so those things where you can you know really hook into your history i think have a resonance for all of us so thanks for sharing that and every time I see you now, I'm going to think about upstate New York and Platte. So thank, <laughs> thank you so you. much. Thank you. Bye.